Uh, but she says that what we're getting here in Exodus, rather than straight history, is a foundation, right? The, 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 the way in which the Israelites perceived that they came together as a people. And that makes really good sense. If you look at uh, the layers that are here and the thrust of much of the narrative itself, um, and I, I don't think that does any injustice to uh, uh, what's being talked about. I, I think it just really does, uh, serves to shed a lot of light on uh, the book of Exodus. All right, so let's get into it then. Pharaoh uh, is, is oppressing the people. Moses and Aaron have been called. They go back into Egypt and they begin to struggle with Pharaoh. All right, everybody have a hand up? Uh, are there hand ups over there for chapter or for weeks one, two, and three? It'd probably be easier for you if you had a, a hand up for chapter three. All right, uh, uh, chapters five through six uh, uh, set up the struggle with Pharaoh. And in chapter 5, we find Moses and Aaron confronting Pharaoh and telling him that God has said, <clears throat> let my people go. And I have the text here. Okay. Uh, yeah, right here. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go so that they may celebrate a festival to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh says, and this is the kicker right here, who is this God? Right? I don't know this God. Who is this God uh, that I should heed, uh, heed him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. He's scoffing, right? He's scoffing at God, and he says, "You want to see gods? I've got a million gods, right? I've got magicians who can do anything that you guys can do. No, get out of here, right?" Uh, then they said, "The God of the Hebrews has revealed Himself to us. Let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness to sacrifice to the Lord our God, or He will fall upon us with pestilence or sword." But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their work? Get to their labors. And as a matter of fact, he intensifies their labors, right? But one of the things that he does is he no longer supplies them with straw that they're to mix in with the, uh, uh, the bricks as they're baking them to hold them together. Now they have to go out and have to get their own straw. So he intensifies their work. He persecutes them even more. But this is important. And this helps to explain um, uh, partially, you know, there, there's a tension in these ten plagues because uh, to some people, God can seem unjust. Uh, because he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, right? God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. But Pharaoh goes a long way in having a lot of scoffing and hardening of his, his, his heart himself, right? That he, he's, he's not convinced. He has to be convinced of the power of this God, all right? All right, so chapter 6. Uh, God reaffirms the promise he made in the desert to Moses when he first revealed himself. He says he will deliver the Israelites from oppression by the Egyptians and will take them to a land flowing with milk and honey. And this is worth paying attention to as well because uh, it's a renewal then of that, that, that covenant that he made with the patriarchs, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And here it is then. God also spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. And the, the, the Hebrew uh, reads right there, El Shaddai, right? And, and that's, that's from the uh, Elohish. That's, that's what the Elohish source calls God, El, uh, El Shaddai. But my name, the Lord, that is Yahweh, uh, by, uh, but my, by my name I did not make, make myself known to him. But now I am. You know who I am. I am Yahweh. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they resided as aliens. I have also heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are holding as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Right? So he is renewing the covenant here that he made with the patriarchs. Say therefore to the Israelites, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, and I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians and deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched, outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. Right? You can you sort of put uh, air quotes around that. And with mighty acts of judgment. These are the uh, uh, plagues that he is going to bring down on the Egyptians. I will take you as my people. In other words, he's saying, you are my chosen people. Right? I am going to be your God. I am extending my covenant to you. You shall know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give to you for a possession. I, for I am Yahweh. Right? There it is. That's a renewal of that covenant that we find in Genesis that, that uh, uh, God made to the original patriarchs. Right? Okay. So tying in then, uh, tying in with that uh, uh, covenant to the patriarchs is this covenant that is being extended here. But the, the difference is that in the book of Genesis, that covenant was to individuals, right? It was to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Here it's to the entire people. 
So this is this is different, right? This is a larger covenant, uh, and, and, and and Yahweh then declares, He says that I am taking you on as my people. Okay. So what kind of questions do you have about this? Yes, Sonia, please. Why did he need a people? What was the, what was the point in picking a people? Uh, you know, I I, the, I think the Israelites, the answer that the Israelites would be uh, to look back to the patriarchs, the original patriarchs, to Abraham. Uh, because Abraham was worshiping this God, and and he had faith. Remember that, uh, that that God asked him to sacrifice his son, and he was willing to do that. Uh, and because of that, then he shows his uh, uh, favor towards Abraham and towards his progeny. I don't. I, I think it's because he's sort of repaying the faith that Abraham showed to him. At least I, I think that's what the Israelites would say. The Israelites would say. And the other thing is that. Um, they, of all the people in this world, have acknowledged Yahweh as the true God. I think that's it. I, I don't think, you know, God doesn't need them. I think what he's doing is he's rewarding them for their their ability to, to, to have faith that he's the, the one true God. Because it's quite clear, if you read the book of Exodus, there are lots of other gods out there. There are lots of other gods in this world, right? And I said this last week, but it bears saying again, the first of the Ten Commandments, ten, the first of the Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments say, says, you shall not have any other gods before me. It doesn't say there are no other gods out there. It says there are plenty of other gods out there, but I am your supreme God. Right? So I, I think that's it, that, you know, that uh, because they identified this God as being the supreme God, that, that he showed his favor to them. Okay, uh, so this is important, right? God, uh, uh, in chapter 7, uh, moving on, God uh, tells Moses that he will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will refuse to let the Israelites go. And he does this in order to demonstrate through great acts of judgment that I am Yahweh. This is the whole point, right? This is the whole point of those uh, uh, plagues and those great uh, calamities that he is going to bring down upon uh, the Israelites. And I've given you a little bit of interpretive uh, information here. Everybody have a copy of the handout? Why don't you turn to page two if you're not there already? And we'll just go over this, okay? The multiple signs and wonders, these cover chapters seven down through chapters ten, okay? And, and this is, again, if we understand what's going on here in Exodus, not as literal history, but as a foundation, right? A foundation document, a foundation myth that may well be built on some truth. What then do those signs and wonders mean? What, what, what function are they actually uh, 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 playing? Well, God is revealing his power then through a series of marvelous signs and wonders in chapters 7 through 10. Right? He's Yahweh, and he says, I am going to demonstrate to you who I am. This is what he said. I, I'm going to bring down great acts of judgment, and I'm going to show you that I am the Lord, that I am Yahweh. We can see the hand, this is interesting, we can see the hand of the priestly writer scribe in the narration of these signs and wonders. First of all, Aaron, who will take on the role of high priest of the Israelites during the wilderness journey, is given a large role in creating these plagues. He is a Levite, and the exilic and post-exilic priest and the high priest all claim direct descent from him. Aaron's power and involvement here then serves to legitimate their own power and actions in the post-exilic world of the Jews in uh, Judah and in Jerusalem. And remember now, I'm, I, I play on that knowledge that you already have. Remember when we first got together, we talked about the four different sources behind the book of Exodus. Uh, and there's the Yahweh source coming from the southern kingdom, the uh, Elohim source coming from the northern kingdom, uh, the, the, the Deuteronomy source, which probably came from the southern kingdom. And then around the time of the exile of the post-exilic period, a set of priests or perhaps one priest sat down and pulled all of this together and added an awful lot of material um, to deal with the circumstances that the, uh, the, that the Jews found themselves in. We're looking around the period 550, 530, somewhere in there, right? After the Jews have e either in captivity by the Babylonians or after they have returned back to uh, uh, Judah and Jerusalem. And uh, because they don't have a king anymore, remember, they're uh, just simply uh, uh, under the control of the Persians, and the Persians won't allow them to have a king. These Levites, these priests, and particularly the high priest, 
uh, run society. They not only run the religious aspects of, of, of this uh, culture, but also uh, the political and social aspects as well. And this is a way then to legitimate that. They literally trace their way all the way back to Aaron, and Aaron is shown to have a huge role here in the exile, right? And this is, this is from the pen of that P source, right? We can see this quite clearly. Okay, any remarks on that or questions about that? Okay, all right. Secondly, uh, again, what are these signs and wonders about? Uh, the demonstration of God's power in these signs and wonders and their eventual outcome, breaking the power of the mighty Pharaoh, king of a vast empire, would also have been very comforting to the Jews in the exilic and post exilic period. Also, in the plague narrative, God reaffirms that the Israelites are his chosen people and that he will deliver them from oppression. This is huge, right? This is absolutely huge. Look at this. If you are under the, um, the, the, the crushing power of the Babylonians, would you not find comfort in this? Right? The fact that uh, you can look back and you, 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 you know, based upon this knowledge, these oral traditions and this history that's been handed down, we were in this position once before and God saved us, right? God can do this again if we just worship him correctly, if we can just uh, 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 revive the rituals and the ceremonies and the sacrifices that he has demanded of us and, uh, uh, and, and, and live upright lives, then once again, God has a capability to restore us to that land of milk and honey. And then finally, the scope of these plagues is impressive. Have any of you ever studied these ten plagues? Yeah, they're fascinating. They're absolutely fascinating. But if you take a look at them in the aggregate, it is astounding what Yahweh does. They show Yahweh having power over the waters, over the land, over animals, over the air, all sorts of creatures. He has power to bring disease. He has the capacity to destroy the crops of the land. In the ninth event, God shows his power to control the heavens by blocking out the sun. And with the final plague, the slaying of the firstborn, he demonstrates his power over life and death. Wow. This is awesome. This is absolutely awesome. Taking in the aggregate. I mean, you know, plagues of locusts come and go. There, there's no big deal there, right? The frogs come out on the Nile. You know, that happens. That, that kind of stuff can happen. But when you take this in the aggregate, this is astounding what Yahweh can do, right? And the other thing that you need to keep in mind is that the Egyptians have a lot of gods, but they all, their power is limited, right? You'll have a sun god, and you'll have a god of the Nile, and you'll have a god of the crops, and you'll have a god of childbirth, but no one god does it all. But Yahweh can do it all. This is impressive. This is really impressive. This is really, really, I mean, God is flexing muscle. Right? Question. Yes, please. Question. In 7 1, I'm always curious by. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. That puts. I Moses made you like God to Pharaoh. Isn't that what it says? To Pharaoh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that like puts him in a completely different. He's no longer prophet. He's no longer priest. He's. He's almost quasi divine, isn't he? Yeah. 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 How do they take that, I wonder? Is there any other reference they can be? Yeah. I think, you know, um, they would, uh, uh, by this time, uh, they would be used to looking upon their prophets as, as men set apart, right? Uh, and there's a story of Elisha who, who uh, is, is taken up in a chariot uh, because of his sanctity. Uh, and I think, I think particularly, men, and Moses is even the cut above those prophets, right? Because Moses literally um, is a spokesperson for God. God, uh, according to much of this text, will talk to Moses. He's, uh, 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 Moses had, uh, has approached him in the burning bush, and God has revealed himself to him. This elevates Moses far beyond the prophets prophets themselves. And I, I think I think that um, they would not have struggled with that idea. I have made you as a God to Pharaoh, right? Like a God to Pharaoh, right? I don't think he calls him a God. He says, I, I've made you like a God to Pharaoh, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it, 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 it stresses the power of Pharaoh as a, as a founder, as a lawgiver, as a prophet, and as a judge. Who else do we compare to like God than Moses oh, and that? He's in a class all by himself. He really now. is. Yeah, he really is. Yeah, that's powerful stuff, isn't it? That's that's very powerful stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Ryan, did God reveal Himself to Aaron too? Oh, all this. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's a, there's a really second, interesting yeah. uh, what chapters in it. Let me see right here. It's in chapter four where um, 
Moses says, God, you know, I'm not really a good speaker. I just stumble over these words. And, and he says, well, I, I, you know, your brother Aaron is, uh, has a facility with words. He's going to be your spokesperson. And then as Moses starts to head back to Egypt, God tells Aaron, literally, he tells okay, Aaron, go meet your brother. So he has the same call, not quite on the same level because he doesn't see God, right? Mm -hmm. um, but God speaks to him and says, go meet your brother. So there's the call to Aaron as well. So no argument there. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, you know, if Moses is here, then Aaron is right here. Yeah. 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 He, he has uh, uh, all sorts of authority coming out of this Exodus uh, uh, tradition here. All right. Let's get into then the signs and wonders. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I sort of have sympathy for Pharaoh. Is that okay? <laughs> I mean, here he is. He's ruling over this vast empire, and he has gods, all sorts of gods. The gods are very beneficent towards him. Uh, Egypt is flourishing. He's doing everything he should do. And on top of everything else, uh, he has a whole pack of magicians surrounding him at his court who, in fact, can tap into the power of these gods and work plenty of miracles, right? Why should he pay attention to this God that he knows nothing about um, from this scraggly, ragtag bunch of people who suddenly say, our God says, let us go? No. And I have sympathy for him, okay? There's an initial confrontation between Moses and Aaron and the magicians of Pharaoh. Um, uh, they go into the court, and, and one of the things they're trying to do is they're trying to impress upon Pharaoh and uh, his court how powerful Yahweh is. And it's interesting. Uh, because now, instead of Moses, because remember, God says, Moses, I'm going to give you this sign. Throw down your staff and it will turn into a snake, right? right? He does this. He says, if, if the people don't believe that you can do this. Well, before Pharaoh, it's Aaron who does this. This is interesting. It's not Moses. It's Aaron, uh, Aaron who throws down his uh, uh, staff and it becomes a snake. Wow. Well, Pharaoh's magicians do the same thing. They throw down their staffs and it turn into a snake. No big deal. Pharaoh says, that's all you got? Well, I can do that. That's no big deal, right? Who's this Yahweh? You can see why Pharaoh would scoff, can't you, right? Right? Because they haven't really shown him anything yet. This only serves to harden Pharaoh's heart. This is what the text says. Yahweh is apparently, this is Delph, Yahweh is apparently no greater than any of his own gods. There's, there's no <coughs> here uh, special. And so then we get the beginning of what have been called the ten plagues. There, there, there's a little bit of um, what uh, qualms about should we really call these plagues? Because they're all not plagues. They're really not. I mean, they're calamitous events. They're wondrous events. Uh, they're bad things that happen. But we've just got used to calling them plagues. So if you want to call them plagues, you can. Uh, but the first wondrous sign occurs in chapter uh, 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 7, verses 14 through 25. And at this, this sign is that all the waters of the Nile River are going to turn to blood. Um, the significance of this is great because the Nile River was the lifeblood of Egypt, right? The, the, the Egyptians depended upon the Nile because not only did it give them drinking water, but it flooded. It flooded every, uh, 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 every autumn. Uh, the, the, the origins of the Nile, they didn't know this at the time, but we know it now. They're, they're in the highlands of Ethiopia, right? Uh, in the, the, the snow packs up in the mountains of Ethiopia. And uh, during the rainy season then, all that snow would melt and it would just come down in this torrent flowing into the White Nile and the Blue Nile. And then they would just, uh, the banks would overflow and all this water then would inundate the desert for miles around on either side of the Nile. It would bring fresh nutrients to the soil. And then uh, the Egyptians, and this is really a remarkable thing, the sun would mitigate its heat, right? Because the average temperature is about 160 degrees in Egypt until after the Nile floods, and then it drops down to about 85 or 90. They go out and they plow their fields. There's this temperate climate. The crops start to grow, and they harvest the crops. And they no sooner get the crops in, than the temperature shoots back to about 106 degrees. They attributed this to their gods, right? And particularly to the god uh, 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 Ra, uh, who they thought uh, established harmony and balance and order in their world. Well, Moses and Yahweh are attacking the heart of this, right? By turning the Nile River into blood and, and all the waters associated with the Nile River as well. Interestingly enough, it is Aaron who causes this wondrous sign to happen. It's not Moses, it's Aaron. The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the water of Egypt, over its rivers, its canals, and its ponds, 
all his pools of water so that they may become blood. Wow. Okay. But, but <laughs> Pharaoh's magicians do the same thing. All right. They go out and they do the same thing. Once again, Pharaoh says, that's all you got? I can do the same thing. Who is this Yahweh? Who is this Yahweh? You see why I'm a little bit sympathetic towards Pharaoh, right? Because he believes that his gods are absolutely as powerful as this god Yahweh. There's no reason for him to particularly be swayed by what these guys are doing. He just sees them as, you know, the equivalent of his own magicians. Nothing, nothing uh, exceptional at this point. All right, the second wonder sign in chapter 8, verses 1 through 14. God told Moses to again tell, uh, tell Pharaoh that he must let my people go. And Pharaoh again refuses. Who, who is this God that I should let you go worship him? No. God then told Moses to tell Aaron. Again, it's Aaron, right? It's Aaron. God tells Moses to tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, the canals, and the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. That's got to be, ooh, yeah. <laughs> the magicians of Pharaoh are once again able to duplicate this miracle by using the magic of their own gods. Pharaoh, and this is interesting, Pharaoh now, he's starting to have a little bit of doubts. He's starting to be a little bit impressed by this. He initially agrees to let the Israelites go in exchange for release from this calamity. But once the frogs disappear, he then changes his mind. No, I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you go. Right. Frogs. Okay. Um, I do have to say that uh, a number of commentators have looked at, at these calamities and these plagues, and they say, you know, if you take away a lot of the, what we might call supernatural, many of these things could have happened just in the natural course of, 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 of nature. Uh, that that, that um, the initial uh, plague or that initial calamity with the uh, river uh, Nile turning red, um, they have argued that that could have been either red tide, it could have been the red tide which turns the water red, or they also argue there was a huge eruption of a volcano uh, just north of Crete around the year 1500 or so, and it spread volcanic ash all over the Mediterranean world, and they argue that the Nile could have turned red from the falling of this volcanic ash. Uh, and, and, and there have been attempts uh, then to explain many of these uh, uh, calamities and plagues as being actually embedded within nature, uh, perhaps the understanding is that you know God's working through nature or intensifying um, uh, uh, the, the natural course of events. I don't. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, I don't see the need for doing that. I always get back to look. We believe that a God came down and took on human flesh. <laughs> I mean, if you believe that, you shouldn't have any trouble believing that God to do this kind of stuff if you want. I, it's all part and parcel of the same thing. But uh, uh, many of these are quite what, possible within the natural course of events. Um, and, 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 you know, one, uh, one coming after another after another may well have stuck in people's minds as something that, that was, in fact, very extraordinary. But anyway, all right. Uh, the third wonder sign, chapter 8, verses 16 through 19, God told Moses once again to say to Aaron, Stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats throughout the whole land of Egypt. Now this is interesting because Pharaoh's magicians tried to duplicate this and they couldn't. They couldn't. This was the first time they can't duplicate one of the miracles that uh, Moses and Aaron have uh, uh, created. Um, and they say to Pharaoh, they said, we believe that this is the finger of God, right? the finger of Yahweh. We believe in fact that this is the finger of Yahweh. But Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and he refuses to let the Israelites go. All right. Any observations? Any questions over this? Yes, Dick, please. What, what, what's the time frame? Are they sort of one day this happens, the next day? Or is this uh, it's really interesting. There is some pacing to this, and, uh -huh. and, and the text will say, um, you know, seven days later, God yeah. speaks to Moses or something like that. I didn't, I didn't really put the timing in, okay. but there is some pacing within the text itself, yeah. And sometimes, and you might think this is unfair, uh, well, uh, to begin with, in, in the first uh, three or four uh, calamities, 
God always tells Moses, go to Pharaoh and say, this is going to happen if you don't let my people go. He gives Pharaoh a chance. And Pharaoh says, no, I'm not going to let you go. And then the hammer comes down. But towards the end, of uh, uh, God just uh, doesn't even bother warning Pharaoh. He just brings more plagues and more plagues upon him. And the pacing kind of picks up at that point as well. Yeah. So, the Egyptians kept good records good of their records. Pharaoh's and activities. What does the record say about this period and this Pharaoh? Well, we don't know who this pharaoh was. <laughs> that's a, pro that, that, ah, that, that's a ah. problem. Uh, there are a couple of things, and I talked about this last week. Uh, the earliest reference we have to uh, a people in a land called Israel comes from an Egyptian uh, 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 document. It's not a document. It's, it's carved in stone. It's a stele. Uh, uh, mentioning uh, the people of Israel. This is around the year 1200, 1250, something like that, in the 13th century. There are people living in Canaan that are known as Israelites around the year, what, uh, 1250, somewhere in there, okay? The other thing um, that is, again, I said this last week, you know, did this actually happen? Well, you know, there's enough smoke here that there might be fire. Um, there are in this period, uh, 1250, 1300 down to 1250 or so, there are a number of Semitic people, we know this from Egyptian records, living in Egypt, right? A number of Semitic people living in Egypt. Were these Israelites, or were some of them among those people? They may well have been. But that's about as extensive as a documentation. Nothing about the plagues. No, no. There's no record of these plagues at all. But again, um, you know, if, uh, if, if they had occurred, they may have been so what? Uh, you know, locusts coming all the time, gnats coming all the time, disease among the livestock. Uh, would they even have bothered to mention this sort of stuff after a while? You don't know. I, I, I don't know. But no, there's no there's no document saying, you know, in this year or in this period we were hit with a series of plagues which correspond to this at all. No, there's not. There's nothing like that. Yes, please. Here. Wouldn't they be more interested in uh, recording positive things like a victory or a battle? Or that's a good point. Uh, although I don't know. I mean, I, I would think that if there's a huge calamity that would strike them, that they would, in fact, record it. Because they, they, they were good record keepers, I, both the bad and the good. Yeah, I, I, don't think, I don't think they would have failed to talk about something so calamitous as all of the firstborn in Egypt dying. I mean, that, that's pretty heavy duty stuff, but there's no record of that in the, on the Egyptian side of things at all. Does that mean that there wasn't some disease that came along and wiped out a whole number of the Egyptians? May well have been. We don't know. We don't know. There, there's, uh, you know, look at it. Look at it like this. Many of these things may have happened, but maybe not in the way that is being laid out right here. But they have been fine-tuned over time because, again, if you're thinking about this as a foundation document for the Israelites. What they want to know more than anything else is if they are in captivity in Babylon, uh, uh, Babylon where is our God? <laughs> what, what has happened to Yahweh? Where is our God? And here is a record. Don't forget what God did for your, for your forebearers, right? And he can certainly do that for you once again. All right. Uh, so the third wonder sign then uh, is uh, 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 God tells uh, Moses to say to Aaron, stretch out your, your staff and strike the dust of the earth so that it become, becomes gnats throughout the whole land of Egypt. And as I said before, uh, uh, Pharaoh's magicians cannot duplicate this. But Pharaoh's heart, you would, you would think that at this point he would start to uh, waver a little bit. He refuses to let the Israelites go. So a fourth wondrous event, our plague. This is a plague of flies, uh, uh, of flies, of uh, flies, <laughs> flies and uh, a livestock disease. Uh, that's the fourth and fifth place. God tells Moses to demand of Pharaoh that he let the Israelites go in order to worship him. See, once again, he is telling, he's, he's telling Moses, go tell Pharaoh what's going to happen. Tell him he has to let my people go. If he refuses, God himself will cause a swarm of flies to descend upon the Egyptians. In face of this plague, because God does do this, Pharaoh refuses to let his people go. Pharaoh initially attempts to negotiate with God. He says, all right, okay, all right, fine. You can go sacrifice uh, to Yahweh. Uh, he will allow the sacrifice, uh, the Israelites to sacrifice to Yahweh, but in Egypt, right? No, you're not going to go into the wilderness. I will allow you to take a couple of days off and you can sacrifice to Yahweh in Egypt. Moses rejects this. He says, no, this is not acceptable. We need to go into the wilderness. 
Pharaoh again agrees to let the Israelites go, but then he reneges once the swarm of flies is gone. He still is not convinced of God's power. Maybe he's thinking, all right, you know, this is, you know, this this has happened, but this stuff has happened before. It's going to go away and everything's going to be fine. Maybe this is what he's thinking, right? That, that there's, we've seen this before. Uh, if we just uh, tough it out, things will uh, get better. Well, no, they're not going to get better. But interestingly, and this is, uh, and this is fascinating at this point, uh, the text says that God spares the Israelites from this calamity of flies. If they're living up there in the land of Goshen, then they are not being plagued by flies at all. He's differentiating between the punishment that he is meeting out to the Egyptians and the way that he is treating the Israelites. The fifth wonders event, the livestock of the Egyptians, uh, the livestock are struck with a disease God tells Moses to demand of Pharaoh that he let the Israelites go in order to worship him. If he refuses, tell Pharaoh that God himself will cause a disease to descend upon the livestock in the field. The horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. And the flocks. When the plague struck, it once again spared all of the Israelites. Pharaoh, with his heart still hardened, refused to let the Israelites go. You have to wonder what the Egyptian people are thinking about all of this, right? These plagues, one after the other after the other. We get some evidence in the text that the people are starting to murmur against Pharaoh. <coughs> Let these people go. What difference does it make? Yeah, let them go. The sixth event, the outbreak of boils. Keeping calamity upon calamity, God does not even have Moses warn Pharaoh this time about another impending calamity. Instead, he instructs Moses and Aaron to go to the kilns where they have been baking bricks, gather up some ashes, and have Moses throw these ashes into the air. They will then turn into boils and descend upon all of the people, all of the animals and the people as well, and even the magicians. There is, uh, if, if we can use the phrase here, poetic justice in this, is there not, right? Because the, the Egyptians and Pharaoh uh, have been um, oppressing the Israelites by making them uh, uh, bake uh, bricks without any straw at all and now Moses and Aaron go and they gather up the ashes from, from inside those kilns and they throw them up and these turn into a source of oppression against the Egyptians. Even this does not sway Pharaoh. He refuses to let the Israelites go. The seventh wondrous occurrence is hail and thunder hail and thunder. And this is interesting because if you uh, read the narrative where Yahweh reveals himself to Moses, uh, there's all sorts of what, atmospheric events. And when we get to uh, Mount Sinai, there's going to be thunder and there's going to be lightning as well. Um, God seems to manifest his power oftentimes in thunder and lightning. Here it's going to be hail and thunder. God instructs Moses to tell Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go so that they may worship me. For this time I will send my plagues upon you yourself and upon your officials and upon your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. Right? This is God's rationale for hardening Pharaoh's heart. He says, I want you to learn and learn it well. There is no one like me on earth. This is why I've let you live, to show you my power and to make my name resound throughout all the earth. And I cut the text off there, and it goes on to say, if I had desired, I could have smitten you and you would be dead by now. But he says, I don't want to do that. I want you to learn who I am. Moses, finally, Moses has sort of been uh, 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 on the uh, fringes of things. Moses is the originator of this catastrophe. He raises his rod and causes the hail to fall and destroy crops and animals. The hail is accompanied with great thunder and fire. And this is interesting. This is absolutely fascinating. It says it destroyed, the text says, it destroyed all of the crops except for the wheat and spelt, which had not yet germinated. And the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were living in Egypt, was spared. Well, this caught Pharaoh's attention, and he initially relented and agreed to allow the Israelites to go worship Yahweh. But then he again changed his mind and hardened his heart. Hardened his heart. So you see, God then is turning to, he's already uh, uh, made the Nile uh, 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 polluted with all of that blood and threatening the, the crops of the Egyptians. And now he attacks the crops that are growing out in the field. The eighth plague then, 
That is a plague of locusts. God tells Moses to ask Pharaoh, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? See this? This is interesting. You, Pharaoh, you most powerful ruler out there, how long are you going to be stiff-necked? When are you going to acknowledge my power? When are you going to humble yourself before me? If you refuse to let my people go, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country. Pharaoh again attempts to negotiate with God, the hubris, right? <laughs> Pharaoh, he says, all right, but, but, he says, you can go. He tells Moses, you can go worship your God out there in the wilderness, but only the males, only the males. You have to leave your children, you have to leave your women, you have to leave your livestock, I will let your males go. This is unacceptable to Moses. Moses then stretches out his hand and a massive swarm of locusts now devours everything in its path including the wheat and smelt crops which have just started to germinate. I find this fascinating, right? So the locusts, they, they came through and they cleaned out everything that was above ground. <clears throat> and now, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, it was the hail. It was the hail uh, that beat everything into the ground. But then the, 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 the wheat and the smelt started coming up and God causes locusts to come through and just clean that out. <clears throat> what is smelt? Aha! You don't know what spelt is, neither do I. <laughs> That's spelt. It's a grain. It's a grain. It's a grain. Right? it's a grain in the same family as wheat, barley, and rye. So now you know what spelt is. Right? There is spelt. Yeah, apparently it's pretty tasty. It has a nutty flavor. You know, have you had it before? Spelt. It's like an ancient wheat, and it's one of the few yeah. forms that hasn't been added, had GMO. Oh, is that, yeah, so it's still pure? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But apparently it's highly nutritious, uh, even more so, they say, than wheat, right? I, like, I, I, I read the wiki article. It tastes like wheat. It's a little coarser. But, Is it? Yeah. But, yeah. but there's buy, You can buy whole fruit. So they use it to make flour. bread. Yeah. Oh, they they uh, ground it and made uh, bread out of the flour, out of the flour. So this is gone now. Right? Yeah. Where's the land of Goshen? Yeah. The land of Goshen. Right here. This is the land of Goshen. The Nile, essentially the Nile Delta area, that area up in there. Land of Goshen. Okay. Now, Ron, the, the Israelites were immune to all these things going on. Well, every now and then, it, the text specifically says that God will exempt them from yeah. from so the plague. So they had food and, yeah. and yeah, no more boils. Yeah. yeah. Where did the Pharaoh reside? Oh, that's really interesting. By this time, he's up here in Tanis. Where's Tanis? This area right up and through here. That's where the uh, pharaohs of the New Kingdom are living. Uh, they started out here in Memphis in the Old Kingdom, uh, and then in the Middle Kingdom, they moved down to Thebes. Thebes is on down right about down here. That's where the Valley of the Kings and all that is down there. And then in the New Kingdom, they move up here. And they move up here because they're administering this huge empire. Right, uh, and sort of more centrally located. So the uh, pharaohs of the New Kingdom, presumably when the Exodus took part, are living up here in Tanis. The area of Tanis, no, it's Tanis. Okay. All right, the ninth plague in deep darkness. Without any warning to Pharaoh, God orders Moses to stretch out his hand and cause a deep darkness to fall across the land. This holds for three days and nights. <coughs> And the Israelites yeah. are spared. They still have light. There's light in the land of Goshen. <laughs> um, some commentators, this is interesting. Some commentators know that this darkening, right, this darkening of the land by Yahweh would have been perceived as a direct attack upon one of the most powerful of all the Egyptian deities, the god Ra, who was identified as a spirit god of the sun. Ra was worshipped by the Egyptians as a provider of light and warmth, and the Egyptians believed that it was due to him that their crops grew. He was viewed as a great protector god of Egypt and a great nurturing spirit in the land. And I have a hieroglyphic. Oops, let's uh, get to the hieroglyph. There he is right there. There's a, a, a painting of him in one of the You can see this is the god Ra. He has um, uh, a falcon head, a falcon head right here. And this is a solar disk, right? It is emblematic of the sun. And then he has the cobra. This is a sign of the uh, new kingdom, the pharaohs of the new kingdom, that cobra right there surrounding the solar disk itself, right? So this, this ability then to blot out the sun is a direct attack upon the power of one of the chief gods of, the, uh, of, of, of ancient Egypt and a god is particularly associated with the Pharaoh as well, right? Uh, and, and Yahweh then is, uh, at this point, uh, he is demonstrating uh, the, the, the real weakness of these Egyptian gods. All right, uh, Pharaoh again tries to bargain with God. He tells Moses he will let the Israelites go, but they must leave their flocks behind. And Moses says, no, this is unacceptable. Furious, Moses, uh, Pharaoh dismisses Moses and tells him that he never wants to see his face again. <laughs> 
Right? Get out of here. Never going to see you again. Well, this is a little bit contradictory because right in the next chapter, there's Moses in front of Pharaoh once again. And it tells us we we're working from two different sources right here. That's what's going on. Before we go on, you have any questions or observations about the ninth plague, the darkness falls over the land of Egypt? That's pretty powerful stuff. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. The tenth plague, the slaying of the firstborn. God tells Moses that he will visit one more calamity upon the Egyptians, and it will be so terrible that afterwards Pharaoh will drive the Israelites out of Egypt. Right? Not only is he going to let you go, he's going to drive you out. Okay? <laughs> God also tells Moses to have the Israelites ask their neighbors for objects made out of gold and silver. This will later on be melted down and recast into items used for the tabernacle built in the wilderness. Did you ever wonder where they all got all that gold and silver? Right? They plundered the Egyptians, and then they melted it down in the wilderness and built this tabernacle to God. Moses then tells Pharaoh of the impending disaster, but the king's heart is hardened and he will not let the Israelites go. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt. Pharaoh, in the face of this disaster and the loss of his own son, agreed unconditionally to let the Israelites go into the wilderness and worship their God. And here's what he says. Rise up, go away from my people, both you and the Israelites. Go, worship the Lord, worship Yahweh. As you said, take your flocks and your herds, as you said, and be gone, and bring a blessing on me. <laughs> so finally, he acknowledges them, and in his deep despair, in this calamity, the power of Yahweh. In their haste to leave, the Israelites grabbed their bread before it had had time to rise, uh, that is, it was unleavened, and while it was still in the kneading bowl. Setting out in the middle of the night, the text tells us, the Israelites' journeys from Ramses, and you can see if we go back uh, again, uh, we don't know how uh, much we can trust. So they start out from uh, Ramesses right here, and they go down to Succoth, which is located right here. But uh, again, you know, is that really where Succoth is? And Ramses, we're not sure right here. But anyway, setting out in the middle of the night, the Israelites journeyed from Rams, uh, Ramesses to Succoth. About 600,000 men on foot besides children, and you have to throw in wives on top of that, and a mixed crowd went up with them. Probably ballpark figure, about 2 million people. Oh, really? Wow. How are you going to feed 2 million people for 40 years in the desert like that? Probably not. Man, probably not. At that time, now this is interesting, the text tells us at that time the Israelites had lived in Egypt for 430 years. And scholars have fixated, biblical scholars, previous generations, and Jewish historians, they have used that number to, uh, uh, the above number, to date the time of the Exodus. Why? Because at 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, we are told in the 480th year after the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt, he, Solomon, began to build the house of the Lord. Solomon ruled from around 970 down to 931, and working backwards from these dates, 430 years, this would place the Exodus somewhere around the year 1330 B.C., right? If you can trust those numbers, but we're not sure we can. Um, uh, because what we've got here is a suspicious parallel between the years they spent in Egypt and then the years after the Exodus until they began to build the temple. How reliable is that? Mm. I don't know. However, there is no guarantee we can trust the span of 430 years given for the captivity of the Israelites in Egypt. Contemporary scholars who see some exodus behind the events described in the Old Testament place the journey variously in the 16th, 15th, or 13th centuries. In other words, we don't know. Other scholars argue that the pharaohs of the late 19th dynasty, that is from 1292 down to 1189, and the 20th dynasty, 1189 to 1077, were very oppressive towards non-Egyptians, and that perhaps some type of exodus may have taken place during their rule. If it's the earlier date during the 19th dynasty, um, one of the pharaohs, the pharaoh who one of the pharaohs who may be involved in this was Ramses II. But again, we don't know for sure. All right, there is uh, the ten plagues. Uh, you can go home and think about this. And uh, next week we are going to actually begin the Exodus. Uh, get them over to uh, Mount Sinai and uh, talk about the Ten Commandments. See you next week. Oh, great.